Hi oh, guys, it's Dave here from Metal Roos. I have Lachlan Watt from Run here. How you doing, mate? I am really good, Dave. Thank you for having me. You well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty good. I had COVID a couple of weeks ago, but uh, good now. Uh, how many times you had it? That's the first time. Oh, uh, shit. You're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> One of the holdouts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. All right. So um, you've got the new EP out, uh, True Heaviness Is Time. How It's sounding awesome. It looks like it's going really well. How's How's it all been? Yeah, man, uh, it's it's going great. I'm really happy with the EP. Uh, it took about a year and a half of just working on it nonstop to get it out the door. Yep. Um, really put a ton of effort into, you know, something that's only six tracks. And yep. I, th but I think that shows, and I think people are feeling it and appreciating it. And uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic. Um, evolution on the band from the first ep and i'm really happy with where the sound is going and i really love the visual element of it all yeah yep. i was uh, i was just saying on the last uh interview that if uh, like my kind of intention for run was sort of i really wanted to make a band that i felt didn't really quite exist yet but was something that i really wanted to hear in terms of the combination of influences going on and if run didn't exist and someone came along and plonked true heaviness's time in my lap i'd be like holy shit this is incredible this is my new favorite band so i feel good about it yeah yeah so what what's your kind of inspiration behind run and 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 those those kind of sounds you're um expressing i think i just kind of wanted to make a a combination of, you know, some of my favorite metal subgenres in a way that I don't think had been explicitly done in the way that Run is doing it. Like the post, I really wanted to make something that was like the, the 2000s metalcore kind of sound, yeah. like the more classic metalcore sound as opposed to the more modern, like really computerized sort of new metally sounding yeah. metalcore. Yeah. Like I'm talking, you know, like the, the Kill Switch Engage, Misery Signals, Poison the Well kind of era. I wanted to take that sort of stuff and mix it with, uh, you know, stuff like Deaf Heaven and Mole and Harakiri for the Sky and that modern arty farty black metal kind of stuff. Yep. And then the other layer, I suppose, would be a bit of the um, post metal, progressive metal sort of sound like The Ocean and Rosetta, Cult of Luna. Yep. that kind of stuff and then i think there's a little bit of uh perhaps more on the first ep than this one i think the the newest one's a bit more straightforward but on the first ep it was like there was a bit of stuff like you know converge and nails and harm's way and that sort of more modern hardcore sounding stuff in there as well and yeah i just really wanted to to mesh all of that stuff together and make something fresh and fun and catchy and melodic but still really intense and heavy and serious i suppose yeah well I, I think you've done that um the the opening track like it hits hard it it keeps it all the way through like um you you obviously bands generally put their their um their kind of most hard hitting in that first but i think you've really nailed that as the first song i think it's it's awesome it, it it really does keep that intent right the way through. Yeah, thanks, man. I um, when when Aaron, the guitarist who wrote most of this EP, was writing the title slash intro track, he kind of had this idea and was like, "Do I keep going with this? Like, do we turn this into a full song?" And I'm like, "No, nah, let's just clip it there. This is the intro. It's just the yeah. hype up, hype up yeah. song." And I guess it, it originally didn't even have any lyrics and I was just going to let that be like an instrumental kind of intro to the record. But the other, some of the other guys thought it would sound a bit more powerful as we sort of got through the demoing process, if it had some vocals on there. So I sort of added a few bits and pieces just so it wasn't a completely blank slate. And yeah, yeah I think both EPs with Run sort of, and more so with this second one, really just wanted to make it something that doesn't really have any any room to breathe like there's no real downtime it's like 
it kicks off and intense and then it just goes and then it's done 20 minutes yep. later or whatever yeah can you walk us through the kind of the writing process for you guys how does that kind of happen um so yeah like originally the first ep it was me and a guitarist called mike and it was like him and i sitting down and mapping out songs i suppose with like dot points and kind of like visual metaphors and yep. just like sort of annotations of like something that sounds like this band or this kind of riff and he and i would sit there and build these songs out and build structures and he'd sort of flesh the the guitar parts out over the top of that and i'd sort of make drum parts and shit for him to write to yep. but this one happened a little bit differently it was a bit more of a collaborative effort between everyone that played on the record uh aaron wrote most of it lewis yep. the other guitarist wrote one of the songs but then the rest of the band all contributed in terms of rearranging and suggesting different things and pulling it all together and putting our own touches on it. And we went through a whole bunch of different rounds of pre-production. There was like, you know, all the MIDI kind of guitar pro program demos. Yep. We did a few rounds of that. And then we did, you know, a round of like live pre-production and pulled all the songs apart and put them all back together again. And then we did the real thing. And by the time we'd done the real thing, it was all fairly locked in. There was a couple of little changes, but yeah, it was a, yeah, but... It, it was a very, very collaborative process getting this one done. Yeah. And I, I guess that's what run into the about 18 months to put it together. You were saying, yeah, yeah. so I guess that, that kind of runs into that kind of heavy production, which I think you can hear on the the record, it just runs you into time, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it, it was, it was probably like the. I think uh, the the writing and uh, recording and everything probably took only you know like maybe twelve to thirteen sort of months from once we sort of got stuck into it. But then from there, there was the visuals and the artwork and getting the video clips done and just kind of biding our time until we could actually release it all properly. And that sort of what took up the next four or five months after that. Yep. So yeah, it's all, it's all very involved. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so you've been on, you've done the racket on triple J as well for since 2012. Is that right? Yeah. For 12 years, almost. It's insane. Yeah. yeah, that is. That's how's that been? How's that ride been? Uh, it's been up and down, but mostly up. And, yep. uh, it's very surreal to me that I'm still in that role. Yeah. It was very hard coming into it initially coming into, you know, Andrew Hogue's chair Yeah, and dealing with all the backlash from his, uh, ardent supporters in the early days. But I think I, you know, all these years later, I've made it my own and people really seem to love the show and yep. it's very surreal. Still, sometimes the people that I get to talk to as part of that and, uh, the feeling I have when I walk out of the studio after, you know, presenting a really solid show is almost up there with the feeling I get, you know, walking off stage, having played a really sick set. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, I would feel it would be very similar. Yeah. It's, uh, it is a killer job and I'm not really exactly sure how many more years I have left in me. I do start to feel sometimes a little bit, you know, it's like I'm aging out a little bit, like yep. the, the triple J target demographic is supposed to be for, you know, 18 to 24 year olds. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just not sure how, uh, how many 18 to 24 year olds are even still, you know, getting into metal these days. I feel like it's a bit of an, more of an aging kind of demographic. So I'm not really sure what happens next, but as long as they want me around, you'll be there. I think I'll be there. Cause I don't feel like I've, um, completely gotten out of touch yet yeah well that's a that's a good thing isn't it yeah all right so um you also just a couple of bits i read about you and you, you've played for lots of different bands um and one that kind of interests me and obviously you probably get asked about this a bit was the art is murder you you filled in for a tour for those guys yeah so when cj originally quit i was uh, approached by the band to um because I've been friends with those dudes for a very long time. Yeah. Their guitarist slash manager, Marshy, 
played in a band with me back in Brisbane yeah. a very long time ago. And yeah, they asked me if I'd be interested in auditioning for the band. So I did some covers, demos of a couple of the Holy War songs because I was in a band at the time called Colossus and we had just done a tour. We'd just done the Holy War tour as like the opening band on that package. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like a death metal band. And um, yeah, they sort of kept me on the on the waiting list, so to speak, for, for quite some time. And Colossus had to kind of put all its hands, like plans on hold for a bit because I wasn't sure if I was going to be going to America or not. Yeah. And then they were like, much to Colossus's dismay, they were like, uh, oh, my dismay. Initially, I suppose they said, hey, don't worry about it. We've got someone over here. This guy's going to do the tour. And so Colossus started gigging again and making plans again. And then they did, I think, one festival in the States with this new guy that they had, this guy called Monty. He was in a band called Alter Beast. And they did like yeah. a Mexico tour with him. And then they decided that, you know, he didn't really fit the crew. They couldn't hang, they didn't want to hang out with him. Yep. You know, the next however many months. And so I'm, I get this like message from Marshy on a Thursday afternoon or Thursday or Friday afternoon or something like coming home from work. Do you have a, a current passport? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, can you come to America on Monday for five weeks? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yes. So I just got, got the approval from, from my jobs at the time. And they were like, yep, go for it. Had to uh, keep it secret for a few days, I suppose, until I was inside America because they didn't have time to get a, a proper uh, v entertainment visa sorted out for me. So I had yeah. to sort of do the sneaky entry yeah. thing, which is a little bit nerve wracking, but got into the country and did five weeks of touring with them. And then uh, went and did a month in Europe and did all the fucking crazy, huge festivals and everything over there. And that was insane. And one of the greatest experiences of my life. And after that, I, uh, yeah, did, did, you know, a two week Australian tour. Yeah. And, um, I think, you know, CJ say what you might about him is an incredible, incredible vocalist. Oh, he is. Yeah. And, yeah. And my, I think I'm a decent vocalist, but, I'm not Varda's murders vocalist. And I think after, you know, a few months of touring that def definitely became evident that I wasn't the person that would be able to step into his shoes. Okay. Yeah. And I think, you know, perhaps I'm not really sure, but I think perhaps they always might've had it in the back of their mind that the ultimate game plan would be to bring him back eventually. Uh, so it kind of, I did, did three tours with that and it was, uh, and the journey came to a close for me. And, yep. But it was, it was a uh, super wild, super fun, really cool getting to see how bands on that kind of level operate and what yeah, it was yeah. like touring Europe. You know, like my very first day in Europe playing the main stage at Hellfest, opening the main stage at Hellfest. That yeah, was just wow. fucking ridiculous. That's crazy good. And then we went and did Grass Pop and Jera On Air and uh, all a whole bunch of other of these just absolutely wild festivals that you know, always sort of been bucket list kind of things for me to do. Like, obviously I much would have rather have been doing it with my own music, but to get to have done it at, at all. Oh yeah. That's still fucking insane. Yep. And totally. yeah, that, that was kind of a, a crazy period for me because from there I went on to fill in for Psychroptic for a few tours the year after that. Yep. And we went and did India. We did Europe and Japan like I did like two weeks in India, five weeks in Europe, a week in Japan. And again, just like pick guys I've been friends with for a very long time. A band like Psychroptic is the band that got me into death metal. Okay. They yep. introduced me to the genre. And, uh, that was, that was unreal and had a ton of fun with those guys. And then sort of came back and tried to, tried to give Colossus another go because I guess they'd kind of got the shits with me doing Vi art and given me the boot yeah it all ended very horribly there uh, and then okay. i after the psychroptic thing wound up tried to give colossus another go and uh i just 
you know, had a, had a friend, uh, like there was some drama going on in the band and I had a friend that took their own life, sadly. Yeah. Around the same time that we were gigging again, had just started gigging again and it just sort of made a few things fall into place for me and realized that, you know, I, I really need to be doing my own music. Like life's short yeah. and this shit is fun, but it is not ultimately what I want to be doing. And then kind of that's how run really kicked off. Okay. Yeah. Coming off the back of singing other people's songs for a few years, fulfilling other people's visions, I suppose. And then sort of just landing in this spot where I just knew that I had to do a band that was, you know, unequivocally me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. And that's uh, like, obviously the bit of turmoil in there as well, that isn't great, but it's, mm. um, those what things that change you, you makes you stronger. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, would have changed your perception probably for the rest of your life. Mm. which I think is a good thing, you know, um, we, we kind of go through these things. It's, I think it's, it's good. It makes you who you are. Yeah. That's kind of what I, I've tried to sort of carry as the main lyrical focus of run in a way is just, you know, that life is in fact pretty beautiful and worth living, even though it is full of struggle and darkness. And so yeah. I really try and embody the, you know, the, the best parts and the worst parts about life in yep. the lyrics and runs music and just spin it in a way that I hope is kind of, I hope to be sort of empowering and positive as opposed to just dwelling on the negatives of everything. Yeah, totally. Totally. All right. So you've got a few release shows coming up. Um, so you got the Evelyn this Saturday, is that right? Yeah. This Saturday we've got a headline show. Yep. At the Evelyn in Melbourne with uh, this deathcore band Body Prison supporting and uh, this cool kind of like 90s alt metal meets post-hardcore style band called uh, Post Heaven and then like a this hardcore punk band called Play Drive, which has kind of just recently risen out of like, I don't know if you remember a band called Pagan. Yep. Yeah, that. It's like their singer, Nikki, she, she's moved to Europe and is singing for a band, Blood Command, now. And the three guys in the band got a couple of other dudes on board for like the live lineup, but have built built their own thing that's kind of got a bit of a similar sound, but moving in a different direction. They're opening. And yeah. so it's like a, it's a real mixed bill of a bunch of mates. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. And then the week after that, we're going to Brisbane to play the Cold Day in Brisbane Festival, which has a really sick, diverse lineup of. I think a bunch of Australia's like best metal, punk and hardcore bands. Yeah. it looks like a good one. That one. Yeah. 50 lions coming out of retirement for it. Yep. And uh, then we're going to Adelaide at the start of August for um, the Southern death festival, which is headlined by disentombment of Bremelin. So it's a really brutal death metal, death core kind of oriented lineup. And I feel like we're sort of run is kind of like, a sore thumb on the lineup a little bit, but sometimes that works in our favor. Might yeah, totally. Be sort of a night, something refreshing throughout a day of nonstop slamming brutality. <laughs> yep. Um, and then we go to Sydney to play with Psychroptic yep. with Crowbar on the thirtieth of August, and then one more show after that in Wollongong with Flaming Wreckage to make a weekend of it. And then that's all we got really planned for the rest of the year. I'm really dead set on moving into some new material. I want to do like a couple of singles just to be a bit of a stopgap. Yeah. And then I have like a really expansive in-depth concept already sort of planned for like the full length album, oh, which nice. will just kind of continue on from where I run as left off with uh, True Happiness's time. And if the right opportunities come up, we might play some more shows, but I'm more interested at this point in just getting more material in the bank yeah sweet all right cool well we might we might leave it there you've probably got other other interviews to do you've been busy this morning but um i thank you heaps for your time and uh look forward to seeing run on the on the road as well um and look forward to the new album thanks heaps dave appreciate your time yours too thanks heaps catch up cheers